Hello everyone, my name is Blade Vildine and I'm the lead pastor here at Christ Church of Labette County. I'm so glad that you could join our live service this morning. We've prepared a message for you and my prayer is that it inspires you and encourages you and challenges you to be all that God has created you to be. If it does, I want to invite you to drop a comment below or visit our website at cclcfamily.org so that you can share with us everything that God is doing in your life. Well, good morning. Welcome to Christ Church Live. I'm so glad that you could join us online on Facebook Live this morning. Um, even though we can't gather together, it's important that we still get to interact. So just as we do in our small groups, my, my question is, how have you seen God this week? Um, I've heard so many stories uh, about people buying toilet paper and giving it away, people serving their neighbor, uh, the elderly by, by uh, picking stuff up at Walmart for them and all kinds of stuff. And, and I just want you to drop a comment. We want to hear your stories. How have you seen God this week? We want to develop eyes and ears to see God daily. So if you would be so bold to share a story with us in the comments below, we can't wait to hear how you've seen God this week. I also want to ask, before we move into our time today, what are you thankful for? <laughs> you know, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of uh, the coronavirus, it's important that we still develop grateful hearts to the Lord. So I want to ask you the question, what are you thankful for this week? What are you thankful for today? Drop a comment below. Last question I want to ask you is, besides the coronavirus, what is causing stress in your life this week? Maybe it's the fact that you can't find toilet paper that, or that you can't get your medicine on time. or I, I don't know what it is, but besides the coronavirus, what is causing stress in your life right now? You know, in my life, I've got so many questions that I just can't find the answers to. You ever feel like that? You ever, you ever want to ask yourself, why? <laughs> why, God? I ask myself questions like, why do good people die young? Why do bad things happen to good people? Do you ever ask yourselves questions like that? You ever ask these types of questions? Why does God answer some prayers and not answer other prayers? Why? I find myself asking, why do I feel alone sometimes? Hundreds of people would say, yeah, Blade, we love you. You're our pastor. And yet sometimes I feel all alone. And if I'm honest with you right now, three of my better friend, my best friends are sitting in the room with me this morning, but the rest of the room is empty. Why do I feel alone sometimes? And I know that God says he's near, yet a lot of times I feel like he's far away. So many questions in my life that just don't have clear, clean answers. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like that? I wonder if you've ever felt like Jesus might have felt on the cross when he cried out these words, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever asked God, why God, why? We're studying what we call famous last words. And in this series, we're looking at the words that Jesus gave as he was giving his life on the cross. Today, we're going to look at the time when he asked his heavenly father, why? We're going to pick it up in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open those up where you are this morning, but it's also going to be on the screen. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. This is what the Bible says. At noon... 
darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. Okay, so here we are. When was this? This was in the middle of the day when it should have been daylight. The Bible says that darkness came over all the land. Why did that happen? Well, I can't tell you exactly, but I can tell you that we know that Jesus on the cross became sin. And when he became sin for us, his heavenly father turned away from him. And the heavenly father turned his presence away from Jesus. He withdrew his presence. And the Bible says that at this time, at about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God. My God, why have you abandoned me? My prayer today is that the words of Jesus may minister to you today in a way that would touch your heart deeply. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? There was an emergency room doctor in Kentucky that told this true story. He said, a guy came into the emergency room after having been in a car accident, and the guy had burns all the way around his neck. And the doctor looked at him puzzled and said, wait a minute, how in the world did you get burns around your neck after being in a car accident? Good question, right? And the guy said, well, the wife and I were sitting down on the porch, and we got one of them new uh, dog collars. You know, those dog collars with the, with the little zappers on it. Now, did I mention that this guy was from Kentucky? Because that's a very important part of this story, okay? Well, anyway, this guy said to his wife, I'm going to put the dog collar around my neck, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to get in my pickup truck, and I'm going to go drive over the hill. And when I get to a certain place, I'm going to honk my horn. And when you hear the horn honk, what I want you to do is I want you to press the little zapper. And we'll see if it works and how it feels. And if it works from a distance so that we'll know if it works on our dog or not. Did I tell you that this guy was from Kentucky? Now, again, this is a very important part of the story. Now, I just want to make sure. So this guy, he got in his pickup truck drove over the hill, got over the top of it where his wife couldn't see him anymore, and he started laying on the horn, and the wife, doing what she was supposed to do, hit the button and started zapping it so hard that he almost went unconscious. He started to swerve, screaming out in pain, and as he started to swerve, another car was coming toward him, and they did what any car would do. They laid on the horn and started honking. Well, <laughs> his wife, upon hearing the honking of the horn, did what she was supposed to do and hit the zapper again. He screamed again, swerved all over the road again, and continued to honk because he was scared. And you know what his wife did? She continued to zap him. Now, why do I tell you that story? I don't know. I just like it, you know. <laughs> a lot of times, there are things that happen in life that just don't seem to have a good reason as to why. Why do good people die young? Why does God answer some prayers and not answer others according to the way that we think he should? Why do some people have the greatest desire in life to get married, to spend their life sharing Christ with the spouse? Then they pray and they pray and they pray and they still lay their head on their pillow alone every night. Why do some people who get married and promise to love each other forever and ever end up crushing each other? Why do some couples whose greatest desire is to have kids, why aren't they able to have kids? In other couples, all they have to do is be walking by each other and they get pregnant. <laughs> why do so many things happen that just don't seem to be fair? It's a good question to ask. I heard a guy once say it this way. He said, 
why is my life so empty? Why is my life so empty? And he said, why do I wake up every day in the same old bed, walk into the same old kitchen, eat the same old breakfast, read the same old paper, drink the same old cup of coffee, kiss the same old woman? Why do I get in my car, drive to the same old job, see the same old people, work for the same old boss, hear the same old stupid stories, laugh in the same old way, get the same old paycheck, get back in the same old car, drive the same old way, back to the same old house, walk in the same old garage, come into the same old kitchen, sit down on the same old chair, watch the same old show, fall asleep watching the same old show, get out of the same old chair, walk into the bedroom, look at the same old wife, ask her the same old question and get the same old answer, (laughs) go to sleep, wake up the next day and do the same old thing. Why? Isn't there more to life than that? My prayer all week is that in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic is that we can really have an opportunity to slow down, to evaluate our, our lives, and to evaluate our faith. I want to take us back to Matthew. Jesus on the cross, he cried out to the Father. He said, my God... My God, why? Why have you abandoned me? One of the things that bothers me about some well-meaning Christians is that a lot of times well-meaning Christians will try to offer oversimplified answers to very, very complicated situations. And that kind of, you know, simple answers answers oftentimes bother me in a very real way. We're in the middle of a tough time, just like now. We're in the middle of a tough time, and a well-meaning Christian has told you, well, it's probably for this reason. And another Christian will walk up and say, well, it's probably for this reason. Now, if you're taking notes, there's three most common, easy answers for hard times. You're going through a hard time, And some well-meaning Christian comes up and says, Ah, the reason this is going on is because it's your fault. If you didn't have some sort of sin in your life, there must be some sort of secret sin in your life. Because if there's sin in your life, that's why this bad thing is happening. And if you just had a little bit more faith, then this wouldn't be happening to you. So therefore, I conclude that it's your fault. Maybe you've never heard that, and I hope that you haven't, but I have. Another thing that you hear would be this. Another person will come up and say, oh, I know why bad things are happening to you. I know why. It's Satan's fault. You know, it's Satan's fault. Could it be Satan? I don't know. You know, know, the truth of the matter is that the evil one does attack us. The evil one is going to shoot his flaming arrows at us. But in the same breath, as someone saying it's Satan's fault, I have another Christian that walk up to me and say, you know, it's God's will. It's God's will that these bad things are happening to you. So my question is, which is it? Is it my fault? Is it Satan's attack? Is it God's will? Is it two of these three? Is it some sort of combination of these? The problem for me is that there's oftentimes very complex situations in which I just can't find simple answers to those questions. What's interesting to me is that we examine the words of Jesus on the cross, and here's what we notice as we look at his life as a whole. We know that from the moment that he was born, the spiritual enemy, Satan, attacked Jesus. And he oftentimes did this through people. Even when Jesus was a little baby, Herod sought to have him killed. 
Jesus in his hometown was known as a prophet without honor. Some guys, one time, on the edge of a cliff, wanted to push Jesus off the, ki- off the cliff, and people called him a heretic. People called him a fanatic. They said that he was demon-possessed. They said that Jesus was just a drunk. They said that Jesus was a glutton. They said that Jesus would hang out with all the wrong kinds of people. They would say that Jesus was not one of us. He was from the wrong side of the street. But what we know is that he was falsely accused. He was tortured, beaten. He was taken to the cross. And what is interesting to me is that when Jesus suffered at the hands of men, he never once complained. In fact, the very first words that I can find in any of the four Gospels that even resembles a complaint was when he became sin for us. When the world became dark and the Father withdrew his presence and turned away from the Son of God. These words of Jesus are the closest thing that I can see as a complaint. When he says, my God, my God, why? Why have you abandoned me? You see, church, it's very easy to have faith when the sun is shining. But it's another story to have real faith when the darkness sets in on our world. So the question that I want to ask today is how deep is your faith? One of my favorite stories of deep faith is found in the Old Testament. There's three Hebrew uh, boys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were standing one day before an evil king named Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar had built a giant idol that was 90 feet high and 99 feet wide made out of pure gold. And these three boys said, we worship the one true God, and we worship him alone. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, no, 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 no. If you're going to live, you're going to worship this statue. And you know what the boys said? They said, they said, no, we won't worship the idol. And the king said, if you're not going to worship this idol, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace, and you're going to burn alive. It's easy to have faith when you're safe. It's another story when you are in a real life situation where you have to see if your faith is real or not. My question to you this morning is how deep is your faith? How real is your faith? When darkness enters your world, how real is your faith? These three young Hebrew boys uttered some of the greatest words of faith of all time. King Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to destroy you. And the young boy said, our God will deliver us. Say it with me. Our God will deliver us. Incredible faith. Then they took their faith to the highest level and they said this, but even if he doesn't, Even if he doesn't do what we think he should, even if God doesn't come through the way that we feel like he should, we will never, we will never bow down to your false God. We will never bow down to your idol because we serve the one true God. My question to you this morning is how deep is your faith. How deep is your faith? Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, some people in the middle of loss or pain would say, God is nowhere to be found. Others would look at the very same thing and say, no, 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 you don't understand. God is here. God is in our presence. What is 
incredible to me about Jesus is that the only thing that he needed, the only thing that he needed to endure the physical pain of the cross, the only thing that Jesus needed to endure the emotional pain, the relational pain, the only thing that Jesus needed in all of his human life and even as he hung on the cross, the only thing that Jesus needed was the presence of his Father. That was it. And the only time that Jesus ever complained was when the Father withdrew his presence When the world became dark for three hours, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When God withdrew his presence from Jesus. And the same is true for us. You know, one of the things that encourages me is that we only see part of the story. We only see our part. Oftentimes we forget about the Father's perspective, which is so much bigger. That's why I like the way that Paul said this to us and to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. He showed us that on this side of eternity, we only see part of the story. Help me out here if you're watching online. Now our knowledge is what? It's partial And it's incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. We only see part of the story. But when the time of perfection comes, these what? Partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like what? Like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, then, Paul says, on the other side of eternity, but then we will see how. We will see everything with perfect clarity. Isn't that encouraging? We will see everything, everything that has ever happened. We will understand God's perspective in the midst of darkness on the other side of eternity. We will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now, Paul says, is partial and incomplete. But then, on the other side of eternity, I will know everything completely. Look at these encouraging words. Just as God now knows me completely. Christian, as you're watching this morning, if you're watching this morning and you don't have a relationship with the Lord, I want these words to encourage you. The Lord, the God of the universe, knows you completely. In the middle of pain, I remind myself that I only see part of the story. That God's perspective, the Bible says, his ways are higher than our ways. His understanding is greater than our understanding. His infinite wisdom is more than my finite knowledge can even comprehend. You see, we only see part of the story. You think about Jesus dying on the cross, and you can only imagine the different perspectives of the story. You see the crowd who just a few moments before cried out, crucify him, crucify him. The man's a blasphemer, crucify him. The crowd must have been looking on this event going, yeah, we're ridding the world of another heretic. Then you look at the disciples part of the story. What would the disciples be thinking as Jesus is hanging on the cross? They're thinking, wait a minute. We left our homes, we left our jobs, we left our families. We gave up all of our possessions. We honored this guy that we thought was the Messiah. We followed him, we did everything he said, and now he's dying. The story can't end this way. Did we do all of this for nothing? And then you look at Jesus as part of the story. And although I don't fully understand why Jesus upon the cross cried out why, 
I know that he was fulfilling a prophecy from Psalm chapter 22, verse 1, when he cried out, my God, my God, why? And then you think of God's part of the story, where God's heart at this moment was surely breaking. And he turned away with the most sacrificing, selfless act of love that you could ever imagine. And as as he loved you so much, he allowed his son to become sin in your place. You know, it's been encouraging in our family in this tough time to remember God's part of the story. Let's look for a minute at some insight that God gives us on part of his story. Sometimes he gives it, and sometimes he just waits until eternity. But in this case, we at least see a glimpse of it. The father's part of the story, Jesus said, my God, my God, why? And we see at least two reasons why. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. The father forsook Jesus. The father abandoned Jesus because he became sin. Why did God forsake Jesus? Because Jesus became sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. Say it, out, say it out loud if you're watching at home with me. He says, God made him who had no sin. To what? To be sin for us. So that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. Don't ever forget, believer, that God hates sin. And wherever God finds sin, sin must be judged. Jesus became sin for us and died on the cross in our place. Now, the question is, why did God look on? Take a look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13 with me. It says this, God's eyes are too pure. God's eyes are too pure to look on evil. He cannot tolerate wrong. God can't even look upon wrongdoing. And when Jesus became sin, when Jesus became hatred, murder, adultery, when Jesus became rape, jealousy, envy, deceit, when Jesus became these things, God's eyes were too pure to look upon Jesus. So God had to withdraw his presence and look away. I like the way Arthur Pinks describes God's holiness. He says this, So holy is God that even the heavens are unclean in his sight. So holy is God that when Abraham beheld a glimpse of his glory, he said, I'm but dust and ashes. Job, in the Old Testament, when he saw a glimpse of the presence of God, he said, I despise myself. Isaiah, getting a glimpse of the presence of the glory of the Lord as he filled the temple, he said, woe am I, I'm ruined. I'm becoming undone. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. God is so holy, God is so full of love, that from his perspective, when the world asks why, when the world asks why, God says, I'll tell you why. I did it for you. Never forget the Father's perspective. The second thing that we see is this, and this is how we'll close. If you're taking notes, As Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? We see that the Son was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. Jesus became sin and died with sin and was buried in a grave. And three days later, you know this, God raised him up from the grave. Jesus resurrected from the dead, clearly displaying that Jesus defeats death, defeats sin, defeats hell, and even the grave can't hold our God. Amen. 
This is what the scripture says, though, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. It says, he himself bore what? He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Read this with me, church. By his wounds, we are healed. By his suffering, by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why? Why have you abandoned me? And God the Father would say this, I did this out of love. If you're with us this morning and you're asking why, if you're hurting and you don't understand, as you're in the midst of darkness, as you're in the midst of the valley, never forget the Father's part of the story. Can you imagine for a moment what the Father feels like when we live our lives without taking notice of the most sacrificial sacrificial, loving gift that anyone could ever give. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting, eternal life. After what Jesus did for us, he says this, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Some may say in the middle of pain, God is nowhere to be found. But we, being followers of Jesus, we draw close to him. In the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of darkness, we draw close to the Lord. And we say, no, 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 you don't understand. In the middle of pain, God is here. In, in the presence of of a good God, that's all we need. We're going to move into our time of communion. And I want to invite you to take the next moment or two to celebrate what Jesus did for the cross, did on the cross for us. His body was broken. His blood was poured out. And we get to celebrate that until the Lord comes again. We get to celebrate that Jesus bore the weight of our sins upon the cross. So that what? That we, disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, he did this so that we might become the righteousness of God. I want to invite you to take the next moment and celebrate communion with the people that are in your midst. Can we go to the Lord in prayer together? Father, in the name of Jesus, our crucified and resurrected King, Lord, we want to repent before you and believe and follow your Son. Your kingdom is not of this world, and we are so grateful to be called citizens of the kingdom of God. Lord, help us in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the darkness. Help draw us closer to your heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to move into our time of offering. And since we're not here in person, I want to invite you to give online at cclcfamily.org backslash give. We're also going to be here at the building from 11 a.m. till noon, so about the next hour or so. And I want to share a quick story with you. I shared it the other night about how the church can be the church outside the walls of the church. There was this guy in our church uh, that bought a case of toilet paper, not to hoard for himself, but to take it home and disperse it to all of his friends. I've heard stories of uh, of the church stepping up and and visiting the elderly and and getting groceries for the elderly. And and just this last week, we got to feed several families from our pantry. And the beautiful thing about the church is that when we give, the Lord multiplies it. 
When we give, the Lord multiplies it. And this morning, I want to ask you to be bold enough to give above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings. It has become known to us that until further notice, we are not going to be able to gather in person. So our leadership team and team leaders got together just a few nights ago and we discussed how we can best serve the church in the midst of us not being able to gather together. And what we decided was that we would buy a new video camera and some other parts to go along with it so that we can give you, the church, the best possible video and audio that we can. So we want to ask you to give above and beyond to help us minister to you digitally. We're so glad you could join us. I want to invite you one more time to share this post so that we can be the church and evangelize the lost in the midst of a dark world. As we close every church service the same way, and we fully believe this, whoever finds Christ finds life. God bless you, and let's have a great week in the Lord.